Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Abraham Abhishek from the Water Channel. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Water Channel as well as IIT Delft. I would like to acknowledge Maria Laura Sorrentino, who's in the room, who's uh, the driving force behind uh, this series of webinars. And uh, I think it would not be an exaggeration to say that uh, in the past uh, couple of years, um, uh, we have seen some really unprecedented things. We've had uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, sure. But we have also seen a surge uh, of sorts in the frequency and intensity of floods, cyclones, forest fires. And uh, these are what we would call natural disasters because they come from nature. And uh, so the solutions for dealing with them or the strategies for dealing with them or the strategies for limiting their worst effects should be nature-based as well. I think that's a fair, um, uh, fair position to take. So this is the context, the argument, the pretext for our discussions today. Uh, we are most fortunate to have here with us Zoran uh, Virginovich from IIT Delft, uh, who has several decades of experience in the areas of uh, risk assessment, uh, climate change adaptation, uh, and hydroinformatics. And uh, he's associate professor at IIT Delft and holds honorary and adjunct uh, professor positions at several prestigious universities around the world. And uh, Zoran was also one of the driving forces behind uh, the European Commission funded ReConnect project, uh, which dealt in large scale nature based solutions. And I suppose a large part of what we hear from him today will be from that project. So thanks for uh, joining us, Zoran. We really appreciate your time. And before handing over the proceedings to you, I would just like to encourage all the participants to please uh, post your questions and comments in the chat box. Uh, we will keep collecting them throughout um, the presentation and we will uh, discuss them. We'll try to discuss each one of them after Zoran has completed his presentation. So Zoran, it's over to you. I stop sharing here so you can start sharing your presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Abraham. <clears throat> um, thank you for a very good introduction. Also, I'd like to thank to Mario Laura Sorrentino for inviting me to uh, to give this presentation today, to participate in this series of seminars. Um, as Abraham mentioned, the, uh, we are observing uh, all kinds of climate extremes nowadays, from too dry to too wet. Um, there are different ways to respond to such things. So uh, one of them is through nature-based solutions. And I would like to uh, welcome everyone, particularly those colleagues who are joining in very early hours and also those who are joining in late hours. I think we are, we've kind of looked for a time in between, so um, we hope that you'll be able to, uh, um, to, get, to get what you want out of this. I would, my intention is to give you um, a, a kind of an overview from two projects, European Commission funded projects. One is uh, Pearl project, which completed a couple of months before the Reconnect project started. So that's why my uh, subtitle is from Pearl to Reconnect, and I hope you will, um, you will enjoy this presentation. So as I mentioned just now, the, um, we can observe almost daily um, that, we, that we, in one part, uh, we have the uh, two dry periods and the other parts we have the uh, two wet periods. In the past, maybe this, this kind of shifts or, or kind of extremes were observed on a more kind of rare scale. Um, whereas nowadays we can see these things almost daily happening in, in some countries, some places around the world. I know, for example, in Australia, uh, Within one season, they can get you know, shifts from a too dry to too wet and back to too dry and, and so on. So that poses extreme challenge for managing water systems because the systems are designed for one series of, for example, rainfall events um, that, um, uh, that maybe are no longer uh, appropriate or relevant given the, uh, the trends of climate change. So th there are different ways how to respond to that. Uh, and I will give you my view on this. The, um, just before I start, I'd like to show you some of these um, um, University of Leuven um, MDAT database records, which show that the, uh, we have, uh, this plot shows three kinds of uh, disasters or kind of events that led to disasters. Uh, we have biological, geological, and we have hydrometeorological. Of course, the, uh, um, I don't have the data to show, for example, the latest pandemic, but but on the whole, if we look at the trends, the hydrometeorological disasters are really taking the, uh, the steepest rise. And what is, what is a little bit puzzling here 
is that our technological advancements have really progressed enormously. We have, we can see technology and the um, the way how we deal with water problems and in, in, in general, uh, for example, communication technologies um, um, and many other technologies, maybe some uh, construction practices and, uh, and technologies that we use for construction of water systems have really, really advanced in almost over the last uh, 50 or 100 years, of course. But if you look at the, at the disaster events and the hydrometeorological, which are predominantly floods, um, these are still on the rise. So obviously there is some disconnect that despite our technological advancements, we are still unable to reverse the trend. Um, so this is the trend that we are observing nowadays. Um, and just to give some illustrations, in 2013, there was a super typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda in Philippines. Um, I, at that time I was um, in Manila and um, I was working for ADB on some projects. And I remember when this happened, it was a really mega, mega event. It, um, it took so many lives and it brought so much of um, material damage. So the, the Tacloban is the area that was hit the most back then. And so it also caused a large number of people to be displaced. So this, this is really, this was an extreme event in terms of the hydrometeorological parameters, which obviously has caused the, um, the extreme impact. Then if we go to, um, I'll just run through some of these uh, events that took place. Um, on 6 September 2017, uh, if you remember, there was a hurricane Irma that took place in the Caribbean. It really went, the eye of this big storm uh, and the big system that went through the Caribbean uh, passed through the island of St. Martin, which is, uh, you, some of you may know, it's shared between the uh, French and the Dutch uh, administrations. It really brought enormous uh, impacts to, to, to that island, to the infrastructure, to the houses. A lot of houses have got demolished completely, and a lot of them lost their roofs. So um, after that, and the, and the, and the Yolanda uh, uh, typhoon, which is the system called hurricane in the, um, uh, in the Caribbean, in, in, uh, up until 2013, it was regarded the most um, intense uh, tropical storm that grew into the uh, into the typhoon. So uh, after that, the Irma brought, broke a new record. Uh, but then after that, there was Hurricane Dorian, which for which some people believe that it's, it brought an even new, even even more recent, uh, another record. So these things are happening, as we can see. Uh, this was in 2019, constantly. Um, on the other hand, we, we, we can re recall, for example, in 2014, there was a bad storm in Southeast Europe and Balkans, which brought also unprecedented damage to the um, livelihoods, to the infrastructure. Um, and this really came from the rainfall, um, uh, the storm related rainfall, that, which lasted for, for a while, very intense, and then caused a lot of rivers to, uh, to burst the dikes and to, uh, to cause some flooding. So again, in, the, in this part of the world, this was unprecedented event that took place in 2014. Some damage was in the order of 3.5 billion euros, some estimate, and the casualties in the order of um, um, several dozens. So in 2011, I also was, was, um, I was in Thailand back then, and, um, and it was the, uh, the, the, it, 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 the event that, that took place over a period of few months. There were few storms that coincided. And, um, and caused the wide scale flooding, which is nowadays uh, referred to as Great Thailand Floods. So that was in 2011. Also enormous uh, damage material and also the, uh, in terms of the, the human losses. So the, these examples that I just brought, and we can find many, many more of these examples. I'm just starting off by, by, by I want to, um, my point here is that these are the uh, examples of extreme events in hydrometeorological terms which obviously have caused the extreme impacts. Uh, but it is not always the case that extreme events can cause large or significant or extreme impacts. It can be also that the small events can cause extreme impacts. And um, uh, there are many studies that prove that. How does that happen? It happens through the cascading effects that you may have a, a particular event that can cause a physical impact, uh, which can then lead uh, to a certain uh, um, disruption in the society. Maybe uh, it causes damages of the houses, people need to be relocated. But then, but then you may also have the water that stays 
on the ground, like it happened in, uh, for example, in Thailand, the water stayed on the ground for maybe uh, two to three months in some parts even. Um, and, and that may cause uh, disruptions or outages for the power supply. When the power supply is disrupted, then you may get some other chain reaction problems. Maybe uh, certain uh, uh, technologies and systems will be disrupted and then there will be some environmental pollution. And then also it can be some public health issues because obviously the, 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 the storm water that uh, gets mixed with the, with the sewage and then the, the two day together can flood the streets and people when they get in touch, they can, um, they can, uh, it, it can cause public health outbreaks. Then, um, then we can, then we, we can track this uh, progress of these impacts further. Social scientists often um, uh, refer to these kind of events that they cause quite significant social tensions. People get relocated. There is uh, all kinds of issues due to that. There is uh, 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 robberies that happen. There all kinds of problems that we that we find. Um, after that, at the end of the day, you also get some economic losses because there's a disruption to the operations, there is a, a, a loss of income, and, and that again has repercussions on, on livelihoods of people. So sometimes even the small event, if it happens at the right time and the wrong place uh, to, create, to create these problems, may propagate through cascading effects and cause serious disruptions, which eventually may lead into really extreme impacts. And it is really our job to look at the, uh, uh, these cascading effects and try to quantify how all this works. Uh, I can see that some coll colleagues are raising hands. I'm sorry, but I don't think uh, we, can, we can have a lively chat here. I would love to be able to do that, but I think we're gonna move on, Abraham. Yes, I would just like to ask you to uh, to please put your questions and comments, the points that you would like to uh, to discuss in the chat box. And after the presentation, we'll have a dedicated Q&A session where we will discuss each one of them. So yeah, please do that. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Abraham. <clears throat> On the other hand, we, we should also not overlook the, um, the other spectrum of these extremes. Um, these are also a couple of examples from Europe. You can see the 2003-2015 uh, heat waves that took place throughout Europe um, have caused very, very significant damage and disruption and also the uh, uh, casualties. Uh, so this is not to be overlooked. Now, when we look from the water management perspective, in the past, we've used the, the philosophy of taking the water when it rains as soon as possible from point A to point B. Um, because of obviously too much of water is causing flooding. But then nowadays, when we have such extreme uh, periods, um, that, that is posing another question. Can we maybe retain that water and then treat it, perhaps reuse it uh, in the time of shortages and do something else with it? But to be able to explore this kind of question and, and what are the possibilities, we need to uh, look into some other kind of measures not the traditional ones, but really going, going into more towards some blue green infrastructure and what we nowadays call as nature-based solutions. But I will come back to that. Um, some more examples where the, um, uh, of the studies which show that the, um, uh, that the European, for example, critical infrastructure is, is, is really under big threat from, uh, from uh, heat waves, droughts, floods, and so on. You can see the baseline <clears throat> which was a few years ago, then you have 1920s, uh, how it progressively goes, uh, the, the, the spectrum on this, um, uh, or the colors go towards red. And then if you go to, to 2050s, 2080s, then you can see really that the, uh, the European critical infrastructure is at great danger because it, A, it's not been designed for these extremes and B, um, due to cascading effects, it may cause a lot of, lot of problems to the population. Um, so all of these, is really um, uh, requiring us to look at the, the how, how do we respond to these challenges, to these extremes? Well, a pathway, I would say, this is my view again, uh, and I'm here presenting some of the findings from the two European Commission projects, which I'm, lead, I'm, I'm leading the Reconnect, and I've also led the, the Pearl, uh, where, we, where yeah, we've had a number of researchers looking at different types of um, issues concerning this particular challenges that I just brought up. Um, a pathway to resilience, our, our view is that the pathway to resilience is through understanding hazards. And here I'm referring to hazards such as um, rainfall events, um, uh, for example, and the change due to climate effects. Uh, then the coastal um, uh, systems, 
uh, also understanding further and coastal systems. Um, so it can be either uh, that we're looking into the sources coming from the coasts, from the rivers, or maybe from urban areas where the, simply the, 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 the capacity of the drainage system cannot cope with the rainfall. So these are what we like to refer to as hazards. And then further understanding of hazards is really, really uh, very important in order to, to build the resilience. And when we, when we talk about resilience, we talk about the measures which can, which can uh, 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 reduce vulnerabilities in areas uh, where the critical infrastructure, of course, where, where, the, where people live, but then also where the critical infrastructure is and so on. Then another one is the uh, minimizing exposure and by understanding hazards and working towards reduction of vulnerabilities and minimizing exposure, which means we do not uh, uh, develop um, an urban plan where we're developing uh, uh, new areas and put the people right on the floodplain, uh, because then obviously we are asking for trouble. We tried, we need to expose, re reduce, minimize exposure of uh, population, as well as the critical infrastructure to those areas which are known to be prone to flooding for decades, if not centuries. Um, and then another response below that is developing sustainable measures. I mentioned the two projects, and I'm, I'm going to be showing some highlights from these two projects. The first one is the, uh, the Pearl project, and Pearl has dealt a lot with understanding of hazards, reducing vulnerabilities, minimizing exposure, and to a certain extent, it opened the question towards blue green infrastructure, which is nowadays referred to as nature based solutions. And then the second project, Reconnect, exclusively deals with the nature based solutions. So, Pearl preparing for extreme and rare events in coastal regions. This is the, uh, the website, which is still operational. And you may go there and find some information if you wish. Uh, I will very briefly uh, uh, run through this project and then come to reconnect. The, the research focus of Pearl was on hydrometeorological events on a holistic view of risk. Uh, what is a holistic view of risk? Is really looking at the uh, various processes that may take place in the social domain, technological domain, and the nature related domain, and how these interact. Um, example of that is that, for example, that the, uh, a particular event, hydrometeorological event that comes from the, obviously from the nature related processes, sometimes can be human induced, but that event can cause a certain response by society. And then that response by society will, will maybe demand a new technologies. And then the new technologies that are developed will maybe uh, drive the way how the society behaves because of the developments of this technology. I mean, classic example is the uh, development of, um, uh, of our, what used to be called mobile phones, now they're smartphones, and how these things uh, have revolutionarily changed our lives and how we live. So there is a constant interaction between the social domain, technological domain, and the natural processes. And in the holistic view of risk, we would like to capture all these three aspects as much as possible. We can never be uh, exhaustive to capture everything, but at least the key processes. So this is what we've addressed in the, in the research, uh, in one of the research focuses of Pearl. And maybe the best, I, I, could, uh, I, could, I could point you to a, maybe one of the best examples on how you can capture different aspects of society, technology, and nature for the disaster risk management in the form of modeling systems is the, uh, is the PhD research of, um, uh, of Yared Abebe, who uh, just graduated uh, at the end of last year in December, and he got his cum laude, and for which he's got also now the medal here in the Netherlands, because the the uh, the uh, the committee who has looked into into this kind of research would have thought that this is a, a great uh, work, and obviously he has done a, a great job by developing and combining different kinds of models there. So Abebe is the um, Yari Abebe is, is the man. If you'd like to read his papers about this or his thesis. But then um, uh, multiple hazards, uh, the project looked into multiple hazards, especially th those coinciding, because you, if you have a river running through a city and then goes into the, the, the coastal system, um, it is always that the interaction with these different water bodies causes the problem. And then traditionally we have organizations which are looking after these systems to be into operating in silos. You have urban water, or uh, municipality or water utility who is looking only after the pipe network systems. And you have maybe uh, another utility which looks after the river, and then another one which is look, looking after the coastal ports and coastal systems there. So, so now when it comes to um, a, a, a large scale flooding, uh, then it's different to separate, to differentiate who's, wh wh what is the exact cause. 
for the uh, for the problem for the for the flooding. So then you really maybe uh, um, need to set up, let's say, a numerical model for all different different water systems and then model them jointly so that you can really understand what what is the problem. So this is what we refer to the multiple hazards and particularly those coinciding. Then multiple vulnerabilities. Um, I would here maybe point to the work of Naylor Medina Pena, uh, who just um, uh, graduated a few months ago, um, PhD again um, from uh, TU Delft here. He worked uh, with us in, in this project, and he's also produced some very interesting aspects on how to look into the vulnerabilities and how to capture those that are related to the societies. And then, of course, it comes the combination of measures. Very briefly, holistic view of risk. We are looking at, a, as I said, social system or socio-technical system that uh, Professor Mike Abbott would say. Uh, and, then, and then how the, the nature uh, uh, works upon this system. And then as a result of that, you may get risk that may go up or down, depending how the society reacts in the, in, in, in the form of um, responses and the measures. So um, uh, Again, I would say Yaret's thesis would be very good uh, lead for those colleagues who would be interested to, to learn more about that. It may sound very abstract and conceptual, but if you go into the, into the publication of Abebe, you will see that uh, the way how we manage to put all of these different models to, to, to operationalize or practicalize this uh, uh, conceptual, which may look or seem conceptual uh, description. Multiple hazards, I just said, the coincidence between coastal, river, and urban floods. Um, and then in, 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 in the Pearl project, we have looked, we have combined different kinds of models. We have started off with the climate models. We've used the uh, atmospheric model from the University of Cambridge. We've used the uh, Imperial College London uh, fluidity storm surge model. And then we've also coupled the, uh, with various DHI models, um, uh, wave models, one, and so on, in order to come up with the uh, estimation of hazards. We did not manage to link all of these models at the time step, so that the, at the time step, these models can exchange the, the data and information, but it's rather uh, kind of in sequence, running one, providing the boundary good condition to the next model and moving through the chain of different models. So um, this is just a snapshot of the, uh, of the University of Cambridge model that we've used in Perl, which, which is one of the very sophisticated models that uh, uses a flexible meshes and, and it can capture different uh, uh, changes of the regime or the flow regime in, in the medium. Um, so that model has been used to model the atmospheric processes, which creates forcing to the coastal systems. And then the coastal systems and let's say pipe systems or maybe river systems interact. And then you have further propagation on, on, on what may become flood. Uh, in, in the Pearl project, we also, um, this is an example of, uh, that, that, the, the, of the model that was used to simulate the effects of the uh, Hurricane Irma. As you can see on the, uh, the moving part shows the, uh, the, pr the pressure in the wind field uh, of the system. And below you can see the water levels uh, in the particular region of St. Martin and, and the other one. And then also we've looked into the, uh, uh, basically triggering tsunamis because the um, working uh, in the Caribbean along the, uh, the, the Caribbean region and where the, particularly where the St. Martin is uh, from on the north from St. Martin not far is the Caribbean plate so the Caribbean plate can also cause uh, disruption in the form of tsunamis so we've also modeled the tsunamis that is then that's what you see in the screen on the left side the trans. Uh, we have in this project we have looked also in modeling uh, very fine physics and, and coupling the uh, uh, not only the 2D models but also using not only 1D and 2D models but also coupling uh, uh, these models with the three-dimensional models to see if there is really a, 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 that we are gaining something more uh, with with modeling the, the very fine physics and using the third dimension as opposed to using the standard uh, maybe 1D or 2D 1D 2D models. So now the um, uh, one of the findings was that uh, that depending, of course, on the on the local settings and configurations, uh, sometimes that advantage may not be significant. In some other cases, that advantage of using a 3D model may be significant. But on the other hand, the, that may be an issue with the computational time if if we want to use this model for the real time uh, operation and flood forecasting. Then uh, we have looked also in the, in the data, conventional li LIDAR data. Uh, I would refer you to the, to the PhD of, of our colleague uh, Mesuk from Thailand, who has uh, looked into the structure, structure for motion technique that can be uh, uh, used to filter the LIDAR data. Typically, we use the LIDAR data to set up a two-dimensional model. But then 
if the resolution is not good and if the depth uh, uh, model does not capture the, the details, such as fine openings uh, that maybe the LIDAR will not be able to detect, then you need to uh, process your data by, by the use of some other techniques. And what Mesuk has done is he has used the, um, Vorovic Mesuk has used the structure for motion technique and he has managed to get some very nice results and you can see the the difference between the LIDAR the model 2D model results using the conventional LIDAR on the left side and the 2D um, model result using the structure for motion technique filtered uh, 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 which has actually filtered the, uh, the LIDAR data and you can see how the flood map can be significantly different so then um I will show you a little bit about the uh, cascading effects. Uh, we, we have done that uh, actually multiple hazards. This is the uh, the work that we have done in Pearl. We have done that um, for the case of Bangkok in the Sukhumvit area, which is the, uh, the quite busy uh, uh, and economically important part of, of Bangkok. Uh, but uh, it is the area which uh, floods very often. And, um, and what you see on this, uh, on this screen is the multiple hazard analysis in the sense that typically hazards are obtained from the water depths, velocities, and maybe durations of floods. But now what we see here is uh, that we have also incorporated the E. coli concentration of, uh, of, of bacteria, of pathogens in the, in the flood water. And then if you really combine this information, you may come up with a totally different hazard map as opposed to the map that you may develop only by using one variable like a flood, uh, flood depth um, and not even looking velocities. So this is just to show, to illustrate that the hazards, they have multiple dimension and typically they, the, the, uh, uh, the data that you need to use to analyze the hazards is the water depths, water velocities, the duration, and also maybe the concentration of, uh, of particular pathogens. Um, as, uh, as part of that work, we have also looked into the quantitative microbial risk assessment, advanced that methodology by the use of numerical models, and, um, and looking into the, the flood water quality. And this is an example from, the, uh, from Denmark, Grave, which you can see on the left side, the calculated water depths, and on the right side, you can see the, uh, uh, which is basically a sewage dilution. Um, and then you can, from these different maps, you can, you can uh, potentially look at the different measures that you can apply if you want, if you're concerned on one hand with the flooding and on the other hand, if you're concerned with the public health outbreaks. So um, we move further, uh, just a couple of snapshots on the risk cascading because as I mentioned before that a small event can lead through the cascading effects to a very large or substantial, if not even extreme impacts. Uh, we have also done analysis for the case of the Sukhumvit area in Bangkok. So what you see on the left side is a DTM with the buildings. And on the right side, you see the flood map for that area using one of the uh, events. Um, the idea here is that when you have, uh, let's say, intermittent water supply in the city, and if there is a significant leakage uh, that, that may occur in the city, like in this case in Bangkok, then maybe uh, when, you, when, when you stop supply of the, of, the, of the water, and then if there are some openings or cracks or whatever leak, uh, so points where the leakage occurs, uh, now there is no pressure, that, that there is no water that, that pushes the, uh, uh, the flow through the pipes, then the uh, external forces coming from the rainfall, for example, in the rainfall, uh, like in Bangkok, it's a combined sewer system, so it's a, a rainwater mixed with, a, with the fecals, with the wastewater, may enter to your system. Then when it gets into your water supply system, then you have another problem, totally different problem. Um, uh, then, then you may need to uh, do a totally different kinds of measures compared to the other uh, flood related measures. But this is how the cascading effects can, can propagate. On the other hand, you may also have some electrical fitting that maybe is vulnerable sitting low on the ground. And then when it gets in contact with the water, it may cause outages uh, or outbreaks with the, uh, <clears throat> with the problems with electricity. And then in places like in Bangkok, where it's, which is uh, 30 plus degrees, uh, when, when the food needs to be refrigerated, then you can imagine how, if there is a cut in power supply, how this can go um, and so on and so on. You can try it. And then also there's a traffic disruption because you have high water levels. So the, the, we've done all of that. And I'm not going to go into details how we quantify these different impacts of the different uh, risk cascading events. That's published in, the, uh, in one of the journal papers, uh, our uh, colleague, Jeffrey Healy, who did MSc. He also managed to produce nice paper publication out of this. 
and it was uh, um, published by the MDPI Journal for Water. So it's a Jeffrey Healy methodological framework for analyzing cascading effects from flood events in the case of Sukhumvit area in Bangkok. Uh, for the vulnerability assessments, I mentioned that the, we need to try to reduce vulnerabilities so that we can increase the resilience because resilience and vulnerability are kind of uh, two faces of the same coin. If you increase the uh, uh, um, resilience, you will reduce vulnerability and the other way around. Um, in, in, the, in the area, in the domain of vulnerability assessment, we can identify different aspects and they range from physical, which is the physical objects. Uh, of course, we can look into the social, uh, which is the people who lives in the exposed areas. Is it the, the area uh, uh, where you have uh, uh, several rest homes and the schools? Of course, obviously, there's the uh, very vulnerable uh, uh, segment of our population. Or um, maybe people who don't have access to insurance. That's another aspect. So whatever the case is, you, you, may, you may identify social systems, you can identify physical systems and physical infrastructure and material objects and everything else. You can identify cultural objects, which may have a totally different value, uh, like a heritage sites, uh, uh, spiritual and, and so on, religious. Um, so that, that's another aspect. Then you can have an economic uh, sector, which obviously will, will uh, has certain vulnerability or resilience to, to such events to, to restore their operation. And then you may have also institutional. So all these, these different aspects you need to somehow combine into one big soup, which uh, uh, may be called vulnerability. And there are different ways to do that. I, I would like to refer you uh, for those colleagues who might be interesting to see how did we address that in this, in this EC funded project. Uh, is to, to read some of the papers from our, uh, our PhD graduates, uh, Naylor Medina Pena. And this is one of his papers that was published in, uh, in the Journal of Sustainability in MDPI by MDPI, and it's assessing socioeconomic vulnerability after a hurricane. So he did this work uh, for the case of St. Martin. Now talking about the flood risk and um, reducing flood risk, you can also, when, when we start looking at the measures, we want to try to find the measures that, that can be multifunctional or multi-beneficial in a sense that not only those measures that can, that can minimize the, the flood, which is obviously very relevant, I'm not trying to undermine that, but it's also good if you can find a combination of measures that can also bring benefits to the, uh, uh, some other types of hazards, such as heat stress. So we've looked into the flood risk and uh, combining measures that can address flood risk and uh, thermal comfort uh, of, of heat stress. And um, uh, we have done that again for the case of, of Bangkok, because obviously they are the, the heat is one of the issue, but then flooding is another issue. Um, in, in this work, we have done the microclimate modeling with fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, and, and other aspects. We have also we have done measurements uh, along the streets and looked into this green, in, green and blue infrastructure, compared what is the temperature in these areas with the green and blue infrastructure, such as nature based solutions, uh, are as opposed to those areas when they are not present. And then, and then we try to derive some um, kind of prospects for application of these measures. If you would like to um, um, read that, uh, then, then I would refer you to, the, to another journal paper by our colleague, Abdul Nasser Majidi, who, who completed his MSc. And, um, uh, and the, the paper that he has published out of that is the planning nature-based solutions for urban flood reduction and thermal comfort enhancement. So it's, he's looked into these different aspects and how he has even done these measurements in the field. He has been uh, going from street to street from different areas, close to different parks and different water bodies, measuring temperature in order to, to come up with some ideas on how to install nature-based solutions that can be not only effective for flooding, but also that it can help the eternal comfort uh, in those areas. So this is the, the work of Abdul Nasser Majidi uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, very good work. And the work is published in the Journal of Sustainability and DPI. Now, I'm, I'm moving now towards the, um, the, 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 the kind of uh, the, the responses and nature-based solutions. The traditional response to the, to the uh, to the stormwater management, to flood management in general, is the gray infrastructure, which is nothing wrong. And this presentation is not to disregard or to, to, to um, undermine the, the value of gray infrastructure, but it is rather to say that we have to look at the combinations between the gray infrastructure and something which is more 
towards the natural systems or nature-based solutions. So the gray infrastructure, if you look at the pipe, pipe has one kind of, um, um, it needs one discipline to be designed. It's a hydraulic engineering. You just design a pipe and uh, look at the uh, way you want to uh, lay it. And uh, after the construction, it's operated by a water utility. You may not need other disciplines for that. Um, and that's, that may be straightforward. On the other hand, if you move from gray to green, um, uh, and if you apply the concept of building with nature, which incorporates the ecosystem services, looking at the multiple benefits, uh, um, and, and, and making it also more flexible and responsive to climate changes, then you need to really, uh, uh, you need to have a number of different disciplines. And these disciplines range from the uh, ecology, biology, of course, hydraulic engineering, but also the uh, economics, um, social science, and so on and so on, because the number of stakeholders is, is enormously go uh, growing up if you move from gray, designing gray systems towards the nature-based solutions. Very briefly, sustainable solutions and the evolution of terminology. Uh, in 1970s, low impact developments in US was a term introduced. Then in 1980s, best management practices, again in US. Then in 1994, you have the water sensitive urban design, which is the Australian term um, for all these terms that you see here, they're more or less uh, uh, depicting what nowadays passes under the name of nature-based solutions. So you have in UK, SUDS, sustainable urban drainage systems, green, green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, a term coined by the IUCN and adopted by the European Commission, ecosystem-based approaches, eco-DRR, disaster risk reduction, blue-green infrastructure. These are all terms that are interchangeably used to describe uh, more or less nature-based solutions. You can find that in a paper uh, that we published um, not too long ago <clears throat> by our uh, MSc graduate, but now PhD researcher within the Reconnect Ladapon Ruangpan from Thailand. And the title is uh, Nature-Based Solutions for Hydrometeorological Risk Reduction, a state-of-the-art review of the research area. Um, there are different definitions of nature-based solutions. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, the European Commission defines nature-based solutions as actions inspired by, supported by, or copied from nature. So basically using natural processes, trying to mimic how the, these processes operate. Um, and they aim to address a variety of social, environmental, economic challenges. You can find nature-based solutions for different purposes, such as urban regeneration and so on and so on, but also for water management and flood mitigation is a classic example. It is important to emphasize here that nature-based solutions, uh, to have an, an, a particular measure that can classify as nature-based solution, um, often described by the European Commission, it, it needs to fulfill multiple benefits. So it's not, it should not only be efficient for the water management, such as flood mitigation, for example, but also needs to bring benefits to the nature. So maybe enhance the biodiversity, and then on the other hand, also needs to bring benefits to the social, uh, to the society and the communities. So only then, if you, if you, if you provide these multiple benefits, then you may, um, uh, you may want to consider that, 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 that you're dealing with a nature-based solution. And there are a number of SDGs that nowadays you can find that the uh, nature-based solutions uh, contribute towards. Um, as I mentioned, you really need uh, for, for successful implementation, design and implementation of nature-based solutions, we need a really, really effective work between different disciplines, if not transdisciplinary way of working. So we need, as I mentioned, people from different sectors, from different disciplines, uh, particularly because uh, when it comes to design, uh, design is not only from the hydraulic uh, perspective, water management, but also from the landscape architecture perspective, because we are dealing with the systems on the ground. We are not dealing with the systems below ground, such as putting the pipe under the ground, where you may not need any inputs from a landscape architect. But here we are talking, if you, if you take, for example, a big pond um, that you need to, that, that maybe serves as in dry times for another purpose, and during the wet times, um, it will serve for flooding, you obviously need a landscape architect to help you with successful design. Nature-based solutions are typically divided into two classes. One is the small scale and the other one is a large scale. Small scale or local or urban scale examples are um, green roofs, uh, swales, um, porous pavements, uh, rain gardens, um, and so on and so on, because th these are really the measures applied at a small spatial scale. They can be applied numerously in, in many locations, which collectively can create a large scale impact effect, but they're typically installed on small, uh, in small areas. 
As opposed to that, we may have the uh, large scale nature based solutions, which are rural, natural, or watershed scale. These are the examples of these systems are the uh, afforestation or reforestation, maybe large ponds or, or, or large, uh, maybe a, a type of measures that, that you can do along the rivers, maybe bringing the, uh, naturalizing the rivers in the sense of uh, uh, opening and bringing more space for the rivers when, when they expand so that, that they, they can flood and, and recede back, maybe wetlands um, and so on and so on. So these are some of the examples of a small scale. This is the, the nature-based solutions, uh, green roof, maybe vertical garden. The, the effect of green roofs and vertical gardens is, to, is the flow attenuation. So when, it, when the rain falls and then when it gets into your, before it gets into your system, it will be attenuated. The peak will, will drop and will delay, it, which helps the system. So this is, this is to say that when you have a combined system, uh, I mean, a hybrid system between the nature-based solutions and gray infrastructure, you may help a lot the function of, of your gray infrastructure by having this kind of installations like green roofs or rain gardens or vertical gardens where you can really attenuate uh, the flows so that you, you can you, so that your your gray infrastructure system can operate more effectively this example of the rain gardens in us which um, uh, apparently are also good for the bonding of the uh, society or the communities this is a i like to show this nice nice project uh, design the big U project in the lower Manhattan. This is the using the, 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 the nature-based solutions of different kinds and planting different kinds of tree that has really special effects towards the, the coastal uh, system and storm surges and waves that may uh, impact this part of Manhattan. So this is an example how the, uh, that, that same area can be designed uh, during the dry day so that the area is used multifunctionally. So you can use it for different purpose and then when it rains then you still have uh, points that people can go from a to b um, without being significantly affected and then when it dries out you are back to your uh, uh, other purpose so this is that then you, you may find another interesting uh, system which i also like to show which is in thailand in bangkok chula long Korn, uh, park which used to be a, a big uh, uh, area which has not really had much purpose but then they turned it what they like to say, the largest green roof in the world. But it's not only the green roof there, it's also there are other uh, smaller scale um, MBS measures which are fitted into this area, which collectively uh, try to mitigate the stormwater runoff and, um, and deal with flooding. There is, uh, there is also something that we have done the work in, in Thailand, in the Ayutthaya, and I'm not going to go to, to that. Another example I'd like to show is in Korea. It's a very good example. I was there just before the outbreak of Corona in, in 2019. Uh, uh, this, this is a Chengcheon, Chengcheon River. Uh, this is the, 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 the river of the watercourse in 1970s, which was really box culverted underneath this, this, this road. Then in the beginning of 2000, they started to break this road to remove um, uh, this, um, I would say, not very nice uh, appearance, and they. Uh, uh, this is how now uh, how this area looks nowadays. So this watercourse has been opened. Uh, it it has much more capacity uh, in in during the uh, the time of floods, uh, and also it has a very very significant value for the local population. They say when the, the people who go there during the um, hot periods, they say that this is cooler for maybe four or five degrees compared to some other areas. So people love to go there. So this, on the left side is how this, this area looked like in 1970s, uh, after, during the construction in the middle and nowadays. Even the real estate and property values have gone considerably high in this area due to this uh, revamping and sort of improving. Uh, so this is a, another example of a nature-based solution that can be, how it can be done. And I will um, maybe show one more example. This is an example I, I received from our colleagues from Rumble, uh, from the Reconnect uh, colleagues. It's the Bishan Park in Singapore. I don't know if, any, if there is anybody here from, from Singapore joining on this call. Um, so this is, this is the area where, it, where the Bishan Park is located with a red circle. In uh, 2008, for example, this is how it looked like. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Kalang River was passing through some lined channel. Uh, which was not as nice as you will see in a moment how they turned this area into, and it was not even effective in terms of the flood uh, management. So now in 2012, what they've done, they've reshaped the entire area with a lot of um, uh, uh, hydraulic modeling, but also landscape architecture design. 
options and this is how it looks nowadays so the water does not run uh, through through that lined channel but instead it goes meanders and then there is a large area that allows flooding on the left side here you see uh, uh, example how this area may look like uh, on a dry day uh, and on the right side you will see the same area how it looks on the wet day so when the when the high flows are so again people can go uh, across from this uh, from one area to another and it's a very very appealing to the community there it is for, uh, not only for flood protection but it's also it's a site for innovation development they do a lot of research there uh, water supply treatment um, as I said, research and education and urban age and by the way, so it's also landscape design. It's a really wonderful example of how the nature-based solution can be designed very effectively. A um, few minutes, I'm finishing now. Um, the, the, uh, you will now find there are many investments and research projects uh, related to nature-based solutions and a lot of funding has been put into that. You can find uh, uh, projects of different kinds, uh, maybe PhD studies in, in China. It's, uh, this is referred to as sponge city program um, and so on and so on i will um, i will quickly mention we have uh, managed to obtain the reconnect project which re stands for regenerating ecosystems with nature-based solutions for hydrometeorological risk reduction it is the project which is worth about 40 million euros in terms of the uh, the, the, the the value of works looking at the construction and the uh, uh, contribution from the commission is in the order of 14 million 35 plus partners we have a number of demonstration cases this is the map that shows where we are demonstrating different kinds of nature-based solutions. And what, what we are doing there, uh, in some places we are constructing them and then monitoring. In some places they have been constructed, so they are just monitoring. So we are populating the evidence base of, of, of how these systems operate. And we are really trying to be critical, uh, uh, not only to preach and look how good they are, but also to look at their drawbacks and try to improve design and everything else. Um, we are looking at the benefits and co-benefits, um, uh, really, for these measures. And we are looking at this an example in, the, in Denmark. You can see the large area uh, which has been designated to be to act as a pond uh, during the wet periods. And on dry uh, periods, it is a dry area. And, and it pr protects, for example, urban area on, on the right side. This may look like a very, very good uh, uh, design from the flood management perspective. But this, this same design has some other issues, and the issues are more ecological. Uh, the, 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 the fish that go to this watercourse, uh, trout, they, uh, they often get lost during these kind of events when you have flooding, and then the, the fish comes out uh, and starts swimming there, and when the, this area dries out, you have a high fish mortality. So from the flood or hydraulic engineering perspective, it is a very good design because you don't get flooding of the nearby urban area, but ecologically and looking at the uh, um, uh, yeah, ecosystem perspective, this is not very good. And, this, and what we are trying to do in this project is maybe to think about some options, how this can be improved. And we are looking at the biodiversity enhancement with these measures and also social well-being. We have also the uh, uh, colleagues from the uh, medical school of University of Exeter who are looking at the, uh, how these measures can have positive impacts on psychological uh, um, uh, aspects of, of humans. So if you go to the website of Reconnect, you'll find the uh, demonstrators type A, which are those that we are constructing during the lifetime of the project, and type demonstrators type B, which have already been constructed. And we also have collaborator cases all around the world, which are looking into these demonstration cases A and B in order so that we can replicate and upscale these measures into the collaborator cases. Um, I mentioned there that we are not only looking at the bright side of these measures, but we are also looking critically to evaluate how they function and what could be the challenges. Um, a paradigm case in this, in this project is the, the Dutch case, demo case, Room for the River program, which uh, 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 took place uh, for about over about 15 years. It costed 2.5 billion euros at 39 different locations. Various projects have been done in the Netherlands. Uh, it is a very effective project. Uh, it considered a number of different measures, uh, such as the river restoration measures um, and, and, and other types of uh, interventions in the order of maybe uh, one to 200 different measures they've, they've looked at and applied. And this is an example from the city of Nijmegen where you have a parallel channel running to the main river channel. This is on a, on a dry day when it gets flooding. This is, this is how it looks like, but with no damages to the 
population, to the uh, housing, to any of the infrastructure. This is an example of the nature-based solutions, a large scale uh, application that you can do along the rivers. And um, this is um, some photos recently that, that I took when we, when there was a, about two months ago, there was some flooding that occurred in Germany, uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. And uh, I, would, uh, I would like to say that due to these measures that we implemented within the Room for the River pro program, uh, which is the nature-based solutions measures, it, the Netherlands had the least impacts. And the Netherlands is downstream from these countries where the high flows come all the way from Switzerland and to Germany and come to the Netherlands. Uh, and also for the for the uh, uh, river Meuse comes from Belgium. The the minimum uh, impacts have have happened in in the Netherlands, and, and you would expect because of being downstream, uh, uh, but not. It's really due to these interventions. And these are some of the pictures. And I'm not going to. I'm now, I'm now wrapping up this project. If you'd like to go and see uh, what we've done in this project, you're more than welcome. Uh, Reconnect.eu is the website. We've looked into different indicators. How do you measure uh, eff efficacy of your nature-based solutions? Indicators in the water domain, nature, people. We are developing methodologies, how to uh, evaluate, how to address these indicators for the water, nature, and people. Uh, we have got a number of stud uh, 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 paper publications. You may, uh, you may want to go there and download. Uh, we also try to have some um, reports soon that will be available, not yet, but soon it'll be there. And then we are also looking at the, uh, at the platform and I'll show you, we, are, we, are, we, are the, we, we have a real time uh, monitoring platform, which is not publicly uh, available at the moment, but very soon it will be where you can go there and, and you will be able to see uh, different sites that we are monitoring. You can see this example of dashboards for monitoring uh, of nature-based solutions, you'll be able to go and let, let's say to the Netherlands or to Germany or to uh, uh, France or to Italy, for example, and where we have these nature-based solution sites. And then you can see rainfall flows, maybe cameras uh, streaming the, uh, the, the pictures 24-7, uh, and then also some analytical tools that we plan to install, which will help us to uh, critically evaluate how these measures work. Um, and then last words, uh, we, we are working on the upscaling these measures. We work uh, with a number of collaborating cases uh, in, in around the world, as, as you can, will see from the, uh, from the website. If you go there, we are really looking at the how to address the barriers because there are, these measures may be very appealing, but uh, uh, to, to us as our water researchers, but if you go to the municipalities and local water operators, you may find that they are actually uh, still preferring the traditional gray infrastructure. And there's still a lot of work to be done to overcome the barriers, which may be not only um, uh, kind of uh, addressed through the raising awareness and, and, and bringing the evidence base, but also um, uh, through some uh, policy adjustments, uh, governance issues, financial, economic, because these measures, it was nice that uh, Netherlands spent 2.5 billion euros, but not every country can afford to, to spend this kind of money. So that means that we need to look also for the buy, uh, financing and business models, which can potentially attract public-private partnership combinations, when maybe private de developers can be also uh, incentivized to, to work towards these measures and um, so that they can, they can create uh, revenues. We're looking at, at these aspects very effectively in this project, and then you, you will also, if you stay tuned and follow our website, you'll be able to, to get some results. So the last slide I mentioned, a pathway to resilience, to disaster and climate resilience is through understanding hazards, reducing vulnerabilities, minimizing exposure. And I refer you to the Pearl project. And uh, on the other hand, developing sustainable measures such as nature-based solutions. And uh, I would also like to uh, uh, refer you to the Reconnect website. This is the, the page. And I would like to give the, this is my last slide, credits to the Pearl project partners and associated researchers. Uh, we had a 24 partners in Pearl and uh, also for the Reconnect colleagues when we have in the order of 34, 35 partners in this project. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to, um, to try to address some of the questions that you may have. I may have taken a bit more time, Abraham. I'm sorry for that, but, uh, but I hope we can manage some questions. Uh, yes, definitely, Zora, and it's all uh, uh, it's all contingent on how much time you have here after. Um, so thanks a lot for the, the presentation, which was uh, 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 at once very informative and uh, 
especially because it had so many examples that you used to, uh, you know, sort of illustrate uh, the uh, the theory behind uh, the NBS that you uh, laid out in the initial part. We'll move quickly to the questions to make sure we can address Sorry, as many of. Yeah, I have. I certainly have time for another 20, 25 minutes. So as, as, if, if you're asking me, do I, you said that depending on my availability, yeah. I certainly talk for 20, 25 minutes. I would be happy. After that, I have something else, but 20, okay. 25 minutes, no problem. Fantastic. So let's quickly move to the questions. I will uh, unshare your screen so I can share the list of questions that we have been building up uh, from our side. Um, Yes. So these are the questions. I'll read them out, and then you can uh, you can perhaps address them. First yes. question we have is from Henrike Clouting, who asks, "How can these models and data support integrated city development concepts and create capacity of city planners in implementing NBS?" How can these models? They, they can be very effectively used, and um, uh, what, what, they, what, what, what is required is, is a close cooperation between different departments. You have a water management department, you may have the spatial planners, you may have the uh, um, um, other important uh, uh, environment protection agency, perhaps, or somebody else. They, they are very effective, and, and from our, um, our dealings, uh, by setting up these models, running different scenarios, obtaining uh, different results, what is possible to be, to be done is then is to bring these different stakeholders around the table and show them the impacts of how things can be done if they are doing if they're working in silos as opposed to if they're working jointly and you can use the models to effectively demonstrate that and uh, what we found for example um, in, in case of pearl but also in some other cases is that uh, uh, these models have brought people have made people to realize that without uh, close cooperation, we cannot uh, develop sustainable managers, uh, measures. So I would say these measures, th these models and the results can be used to effectively communicate the impacts of working in silos as opposed to working jointly. And then this may open up more closer cooperation and discussion between different stakeholders, which is our experience. So, so, the, so this is one example. Yeah. Thanks. The... The next comment is from Abel Imadaj, who says, uh, thanks, Zoran, for a great summary of NBS for uh, resilience and uh, managing disaster risk. Did the Bangkok study look at uh, cross-contamination from sewers? Also, are there any examples of NBS for bushfire risk and landslips? Uh, landslides, yeah. Um, in, in terms of the Bangkok, yeah, uh, well, we, we've been looking at the, uh, and the water quality, the flood water quality and the mixing with sewers and looking at the pathogens. We've had students taking the samples from the manholes and, uh, and addressing that very closely. There is, uh, we are preparing one publication now. We've had a stream of students looking at these issues. So um, that's been looked at. Unfortunately, we don't have publication yet, but we are working on one now. And uh, your other question about the uh, 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 bushfire risk and landslides, landslips, I would say landslides, the, uh, we don't have really for the bushfire risk, but we have for landslides. For the landslides, we have the, um, uh, our key case in Reconnect is the Portofino area in Italy. So um, we do have, uh, we do have one, one uh, 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 journal publication, which is now being produced and which will show what kind of vegetative measures and cascades that can be applied to mitigate the landslides. So, so yes, we are addressing not only the, uh, the, the rainfall induced flooding, but also the landslides as, as another type of hazard. And it is our Portofino case in Italy because we have steep slopes there. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a, a comment from someone who's anonymous. So many tools, examples, and institutions, but what are the best examples that prevent disasters? including both climate-induced and man-made in developing countries, it will be worth to learn and build on that for a country like Nepal. Well, you can find different examples. It is really not here to, um, of course, you, you may find different challenges when you deal with the countries which have a, a, a less economic development and less potential for investments, of course. Um, but, but, but there are good examples. Um, uh, I, 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 I would not pinpoint one or two now, but there are good examples and certainly we can learn uh, what the examples that I brought maybe are not necessarily fall into that category uh, 
very developing countries, uh, but but there, there are the lessons learned here that we have uh, that we are deriving from um, from these cases can be used to bridge some of the problems and be more effective in the developing countries. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, they equally applicable. Yeah. The next one from AKM Ibrahim is uh, there are a few events such as uh, lowering groundwater levels that could be that could have happened because of both um, human actions and climate change. How can you differentiate the impacts of uh, human um, of man-made disasters and climate change in those cases? Well, the, the typical example of man-made, man-induced disaster would be that the, uh, you, you have and, and you can see it not only in developing countries, you can see it very much in developed countries. And I would not also like to pinpoint, but there are many places. It's basically common case where the uh, around the world, irrespective to the developing or developed countries, is that the, uh, the planning people, the spatial planners, they often go by, the, uh, uh, by, by certain needs to develop, economically develop certain parts of the, uh, of, of urban, of, of the city, and they start developing housing on a floodplain. And this is uh, a human influenced disaster, basically, because if you if you put a, a, a housing on a, on, a, on a in a particular area which is always known to be flooded, now you you, you put that uh, uh, the solution of of the flooding to the to the flood engineers. Uh, I don't think that, that there's a magic that they can do uh, to to mitigate that. They can, they may reduce a little bit with the various measures, but you will not be able to make it flood uh, proof area. So, so the, the example of, of how, uh, uh, so you have a na na nature related processes, which is, a, we know what they are, but on the other hand, you have a human related process. And I would see here really pinpoint the, the, the spatial planning. Where do you develop area? Uh, uh, the question of where to expand the city and to which extent it needs to be done with a, with a stormwater managers, with a, with a flood managers who need to have a big say in that, because if the spatial planners just go ahead on their own planning uh, on the basis of the GDP or whatever economic growth that they, they would like to enhance or, or improve in the city without consideration of this or these other aspects, then of course we ask them for a trouble. It's the same thing is, uh, uh, I know uh, from my projects working in, um, in uh, like for example, St. Martin, if you, if you build a house or, or a block of houses right on the shoreline, which is very nice to oversee the sea, and, and start your morning by having a coffee by the overseeing the sea. But then when you get these hurricanes, for example, like, like Hurricane Irma that happened, then you are then you need to really bear for the uh, um, uh, for the impact because again, uh, uh, planning regulations. We need to have more strict planning regulations everywhere and look uh, and, and the details of these planning planning regulations need to be made uh, on the basis of these kind of studies, like I've shown now in Pearl and also reconnect and then if you say this is really high risk zone then you really need to uh, uh, provide the regulations that people for example need to build with certain materials housing and roofs with certain materials not with any materials like in San Martin that, that was a major problem the building regulations uh, uh, actually there the building regulations that exist but enforcing that people comply and mm. according to those uh, mechanisms these mechanisms to enforce that are not very very good so therefore you have people building with the soft uh, and, and very uh, weak materials. And then, of course, when you have these events, then you have major problems. But uh, yeah, it's a planning and also regulations. Building regulations are the key aspects that we need to influence uh, uh, with our work. Yes. Sorry. Yes, please. certainly. Happens all the time in South Asia, which is the part of the world that I come from, that there are regulations, but they're not enforced. Prime real estate is developed in floodplains, and then people are surprised when they get flooded. Uh, Sayed Rasekhuddin, um asked uh, when you were uh, presenting when you were presenting the slides uh, related to the leader analysis is there a possibility for phd to conduct this kind of research to like to respond to that well, there is always a, a possibility for a phd research i i referred you to read a thesis and publications by uh, voravit mesuk who has uh, and also um, another one before that it's the uh, fikri uh, is our colleague who, who uh, from Malaysia, from uh, Kuala Lumpur. Um, yeah, um, so these two pieces would be examples. But then, now, is there a new PhD? Of course, uh, if we would have funding to do that, uh, we would certainly, I would be very happy to, 
to, to lead this research further. At the moment, I do not have funding in the Reconnect project. I have funding for, I've had funding for three PhD studies and all three have been um, uh, occupied. So we have uh, researchers in the, in the places. Uh, so, so as far as IG is concerned and my team is concerned, we, we, we don't have it at the moment there, but we can look for another funding and, and uh, uh, LIDAR technologies and processing uh, 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 LIDAR data for, for flood management is, is a very hot topic. And, uh, there is plenty of possibilities for the uh, to de to define a new research topic. Yeah. The next question is from Dr. Dineshwar Prasad Singh, who uh, says the entire globe has realized the importance of M NBS to various issues related to water sector after after the COVID nineteen pandemic, but we are not able to popularize it, especially in developing countries. What are the reasons for this, and how best we can address this issue? Yes. Um... Uh, the, the the issue the, it's not really okay I, I understand in the developing countries but but also in, in, I would say worldwide not only limiting to developing countries uh, no matter how much we as water professionals realize that nature based solutions are the way to go because uh, you can get multiple benefits they are also good for climate change and climate mitigation uh, as well if you talk about afforestation deforestation the CO two uh, um, dealing with CO two uh, uh, emissions and all of that so. Um, they, they're not only good for uh, climate adaptation, but also for mitigation. Uh, but then it comes the, the traditional mindset. People are much more, um, how to say, uh, much more, much easier convinced to, to, live, to live. They feel kind of they are more safe in the areas where there is, a, let's say, a dike. Yeah, the traditional grave, mm -hmm. uh, for example, a dike. So they be uh, uh, they be more protected as opposed to if they live next to a wetland. If you tell them no, 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 we can create a wetland because the wetland can do this and that and that, but also can be uh, efficient in the flood protection. So 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 people still believe that the gray infrastructure is more safe. Um, so what we need to do, we need to do a lot of uh, uh, raising of awareness. Uh, amongst the, the, the population and very much amongst the uh, water professionals. Um, uh, and, and to do that, we need to build the evidence base. So, so how do we raise the awareness? We go with the results, like what we're doing in Reconnect. We have the, the, the open layer uh, laboratories, if you wish, in a sense that, that we have these sites which are functioning. We are monitoring how effective they are. We are trying to quantify their benefits and core benefits. And then once when we collect the jigsaw puzzle, then we, we can have some hard evidence to show because the best way to, to change people's mindset is by, by showing the hard evidence, how these measures can be beneficial. How can they uh, eliminate the, or minimize the risk for flooding? How can they bring the benefits in terms of um, um, in, uh, um, uh, enhancement, biodiversity enhancement, or maybe social values? So, so it, 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 we're still not yet there that everyone realizes the values of these measures. And there's a still a lot more work that we need to do in order that we can um, um, educate or, or raise the awareness um, between the, I would say, even some conventional water managers, traditional water managers in the mindset of those, but also the population. So, yes. Uh, the next one is from Hildi Nakoda from Philippines. Would fisheries resilience be included in the framework, hence also of critical coastal and marine ecosystems? Uh, yes. Yeah, well, uh, um, these are all aspects that we need to uh, build the resilience to. So uh, <laughs> not only fisheries, uh, but also agriculture. Uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I mean, you're referring here to the coastal systems, but marine ecosystems. We are also looking into the, um, um, uh, the various coastal measures. I mean, of course, the, uh, uh, the, there are numerous examples like uh, um, uh, beach nourishment, uh, using some sand engines, or maybe uh, simple things like planting the uh, mangroves uh, to, to uh, sort of absorb the, uh, the wave uh, impacts. Um, and also that there, are, there are other aspects, but fisheries, resilience, and building the resilience of the whole coastal uh, uh, or near to coast systems is definitely in the framework, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is a query, if there, uh, if there are any studies related to NBS that are being done in the Sundarbans area, uh, which is shared uh, between India and Bangladesh, the mangroves part. 
I unfortunately I'm not aware of any study being done there, but I would be happy to uh, to be involved if there is any opportunity that that that, that uh, maybe someone wants to do the study and then you know just from the perspective of sharing our experiences and trying to upscale our our findings and, and sort of uh, support the study uh, such as this one, but I'm not aware of. Uh, okay. Uh, Henrique has another question, which is how can these models and data support integrated city development concepts and create capacity of city planners in, Im in implementing NBS? I think you demonstrated this in some of your slides. I, I, I've asked this, I think that's one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, AKM Ibrahim asks, says that it seems that NBS needs changes in the role of different agencies doing development works. It's a very difficult task. Could you mention some examples where such changes or coordinations were done successfully? <sighs> Well, there are there are examples of that. It is not an easy uh, uh, one solution fits all. Uh, uh, it all starts from the uh, realization that we are dealing with uh, with, with the natural systems, social, material systems, <clears throat> which is all interrelated. So, therefore, the agencies who operate in silos need to also start to interrelate when it comes to their decision making. Um, and I, I would say, well, being based in the Netherlands here, working that, I can I can say that uh, the Dutch have done a reasonably good job there uh, in terms of the uh, linking different agencies and also using different governance models so that they can integrate uh, um, different aspects of water systems um, into one. So that when you make uh, when you make decisions, you, you you are more efficient in doing so rather than having piecemeal decisions and hoping that everything will fit and improve. It's rather to have this kind of umbrella organization, like here is Rijkswaterstaat, and then you can have mm -hmm. up and also here who are doing that. So that's one example. Then, then you, of course, you can find that in, in, in other countries, but um, it is very important. This is a very, very good question in the sense that, that, that we may need to, to, to make to, my, to implement nature-based solutions, if we are talking about nature-based solutions, which require multiple disciplines and multiple agencies, we need to start with open dialogue and perhaps some governance adjustments in, in, when it comes to the water and nature systems. Um, that is a long process, it's not a quick, uh, but it can be by using our models, we, we have been able in some cases to show that the, uh, the value of working together and, uh, and these models uh, showing the, the results from some scenarios uh, can be very effective in, in actually opening the dialogue. So you start opening, because traditionally we are put into the boxes. It's like also in, in a traditional uh, educational system. You, we study only for microbiology or study only mm -hmm. for hydraulic engineering, but study only for some other thing. We do not, we are not trained to look big, but the problems are never coming in one discipline they are, they are they are interrelated so therefore we have to try to start to break these boxes and bring these broader views but that that is education is classic example but also in the way how we uh, uh, run our governance of water systems and water infrastructure so it is not a quick solution but it's a rather process that we need to move on to but i don't see other way how we can uh, go yes Second last question is from Diego Paredes, uh, who, whose question is about uh, the limitation to uh, apply NBS uh, approaches in cities with a steepness, with steep topography, as in, in Quito, Ecuador, which is a highland city. Uh, and also he points out that it is important to calibrate and validate the hydrodynamic uh, model before implementation um, of NBS uh, yeah. in the model. Um, we, we've had a student uh, from Quito, from Ecuador, uh, we, we, who has uh, looked into some flood modeling there. He had a model that's, uh, that, that definitely you can use uh, steep slopes, uh, uh, topography with steep slopes in your models. Uh, if you, uh, It's not only in Quito that you have these issues, you have in many parts of I know I, I, I worked on a project where we looked into the uh, uh, some parts of, of Belo Horizonte, Belo Horizonte in, in Brazil with steep slopes. Of course, uh, you, you need to manage the kind of uh, the flash floods that you get in local areas, you can uh, you build a model, you 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 can assess different measures that the, the, the target flash flood and this kind of uh, uh, physics. Um, and and yes, uh, my, uh, it, it, there is no limitation to apply NBS in the steep slopes. Actually, by by an example of NBS is a, is is uh, can be a series of ponds, detention or retention ponds, and we all know that uh, mitigation of uh, of flash floods which are result from steep slopes, 
uh, the, the pond's a very effective way of dealing with such floods rather than using some uh, open channels only or pipes. But then within the open channels, you can also put some cascades. Um, you, can, you, can, you can do various things and you can line them uh, uh, maybe with some natural uh, uh, materials so that, they, that you even slow down this runoff. So you can do various things, uh, nature kind of inspired. But then your, your second part uh, uh, it, it is very important to calibrate and validate the Hanang model before implement. Definitely any model, if it's not, uh, or every model which is not uh, calibrated and validated is no better than uh, just a guess. You know, you may have intuition if something will work or not. And if the model is not calibrated, it may not be much better than your intuition. But but when you set up a hydrodynamic model, then you will, of course, need to calibrate it on, on, on some events or maybe series of events, but then you need to validate it. And then once when you gain the confidence in that model, then you can use it reliably to plan MDS. Otherwise, of course, like with any model, uh, junk in, junk out. So you need to really uh, to improve that. And the way to do that is through calibration. Yes. Right. Uh, and uh, the next question is from Bopa Kumar R, who asks, what are the, the methods in addition to, to cost-benefit analysis to evaluate the effectiveness of a nature-based solution in terms of its sustainability? Well, uh, when, you, when you talk about, I mean, it depends how we define sustainability. Yeah? Sustainability, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we can define it in a way that, that uh, particularly when it comes to nature-based solutions, because they, I mentioned before, the, those measures that benefit not only water management, but also nature, like biodiversity, and also the social systems, they can quantify, they, they can qualify to be called nature-based solutions. So when you talk about sustainability, you talk about sustainability in all these three areas. Um, without, so, so we need to create such measures that, that, can, that can be, uh, that can create longevity of, 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 uh, so they can last for a long period of time without diminishing prospects for the future development. It's a, it's a very nicely said, but very difficult to do, of course. Um, and, and the methods that you can use to evaluate the effectiveness uh, uh, of, of such measures, first of all, we, we, we have methods to, to evaluate the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness through models, yeah? and, and running model simulations and doing the uh, analysis, looking to different indicators related to water, nature, people, uh, then, uh, then through various uh, stakeholder-driven discussions and interactions, we can... Uh, uh, we can come up with something what we believe of what the community believes is sustainable, and then you can have that to implement. But that's pre-implementation. But then once you implement these measures, then you really have to uh, monitor effectiveness. And this is what we are doing in Reconnect for, for uh, demonstrators type B, is the, uh, have we really achieved what we plan to achieve? So, so to do that, uh, to say they're effective, you need to do some baseline monitoring before construction before implementation. And then once you implement this measure, then you have to monitor how they operate in terms of water, uh, using water indicators, uh, nature indicators, social indicators uh, over time. And then against the baseline that you may have, then you may say, okay, it's going up or down here. We are really achieving a lot. Maybe here we are even, even causing some other disruption. Like I showed before in the case uh, with this uh, uh, fish mortality that we have. So, so yeah, so, the, so, so what, these are the methods. Of course, you have cost-benefit analysis, but the problem with cost-benefit analysis is that the, uh, if you want to monetize all your benefits, um, you will very quickly run into challenges because uh, um, you, can, you can monetize, uh, the, 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 um, for example, um, if you're talking about the yeah, flood-related impacts. So, so before MBS and after MBS, before MBS, maybe the city will be impacted by so much, and then you will have so much of uh, material damage. With MBS, you may reduce this damage to so much. So, so that, that's the monetary expression. But then when it comes to the natural systems, how do you do the cost-benefit analysis of, uh, let's say you enhance the biodiversity by adding five new species in the area. Can you turn that into money terms? Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, or if you say that the, uh, now uh, my, the pond, like I showed Bishan Park in Singapore, which is a very nice example. Uh, yeah. People like it very much. Uh, it's a very pleasant. It may, may mean a world to some people to go around, to walk the dog, to sit in the nature, to sort of rather than how it looked before. But how do you express that in money terms? Uh, how do you do cost-benefit analysis of something which, which, which is aesthetical 
and even uh, uh, maybe a, a, a kind of effective for the psychological well-being of people. So the methods, some some method, there, 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 there are, there's traditional cost-benefit analysis, and there are a lot of things that you can express in money, in money terms, but there are a lot of things that you cannot express in money terms. And this is one of the great challenges. How do we bring these uh, monetized benefits and non-monetized benefits into one framework? Mm -hmm. This is uh, a million dollar question, you know, if some people would say, how do you do this? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Uh, Thanks for that, Zora. And uh, I'm afraid we'll have to, we'll have to close uh, uh, the webinar now because we uh, have have gone well over time. Uh, with so with that, we really have come to the end of the proceedings. And uh, thanks again, Zoran, for your presentation and for uh, um, your patient answering of the questions, uh, for staying uh, beyond the schedule time. And uh, thanks to you all, all, all the participants, for uh, for turning up in such good numbers and for your questions and comments. A recording of the session will be available by tomorrow on the Water Channel and on the IAT website and YouTube channel, the links to which I have posted in the chat. Uh, thank you again and see you at the next webinar, which will be in November. And I would like to thank you, uh, Abraham, for moderating these uh, events. And of course, uh, my thanks to uh, Maria Laura Sorrentino for uh, 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 arranging for all of that. And of course, uh, big thanks to everyone who found the time, um, which was maybe not very convenient to get up very early, like I've heard uh, some of the colleagues from Brazil, maybe for some colleagues very late. So I really appreciate your um, attention. And, uh, and I hope that, uh, that, that you have maybe heard something new that you didn't know. And I will be very happy to to maybe address some of the questions via email or some other for forums and very happy to uh, perhaps be engaged in some joint work, joint projects, which could be PhD or anything else. So all the best and I um, we will now close the session. <laughs>